Frank Ducheneau may not be a household name, but he should be. He worked on Capitol Hill during a time of great change across Indian country. He started out rather humbly. Out of law school, I was, I had a lot of debts and a wife and a kid, and I needed uh, money. So I went to work for the old OEO program, the Johnson War and Poverty in Kansas City, and I worked there almost two years. And then uh, Bob Bennett, who was Commissioner of Indian Affairs at the time, that's when they had a commissioner, um, was looking for an Indian lawyer to work in the Congressional Relations Office, and I was tired of Kansas City and OEO and uh, put in for it. I think my dad, who was chairman and knew Bennett, probably pushed it a little bit, but I got a job there with uh, the Congressional Relations Office in BIA in D.C. He then worked for the BIA for almost five years, and then with the National Congress of American Indians. But it was when Frank went to work for Congressman Mo Udall that several key pieces of legislation were passed. Other players included Forrest Girard and Senator Scoop Jackson. Forrest and I were House Senate counterparts for about uh, four years. I think uh, I came up in 73 and Forrest was already there. And then uh, I was in the 93rd and 94th Congress with Forrest. And then he went down uh, under uh, Carter. He became the first assistant secretary. So, but I think for those four years, those two Congresses, Forrest and I were counterparts, House and Senate. And we got a, we got a lot done in those four years. Termination was really the policy issue that was preventing good legislation from being considered because uh, tribes would, uh, when, when they first floated the, the Nixon administration first floated the self-determination legislation, the Indians were fearful of it. Even though it proposed to transfer these programs to tribal control, they were fearful because they saw termination. We needed to do something on uh, putting a, a nail in the coffin of termination, and that would best be done by uh, restoring the Menominee tribe to federal recognition. So one of our uh, major bills in that first Congress was a bill restoring the Menominee to federal recognition, and we in the House at least took the position that that was the end of termination. Other major pieces of legislation included the Indian Self-Determination Act, the Indian Finance Act, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, among several others. Toward the end of his career on the Hill, Frank helped write the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Two lawsuits caught his eye. The Brona Ranch case came out of California, and, and it, uh, it, it, the sheriff of the county there, Brona Ranch was trying to run a bingo uh, operation not in accordance with state law. And the sheriff came in and shut him down. Brona Ranch sued in the district court uh, at Juan. Uh, and then it went up, uh, appealed up to the circuit court. Similarly, in, in Florida, the Seminoles were running a, trying to run a bingo operation. The sheriff came in, shut him down, another lawsuit. Both the circuit court uh, in Barona Ranch and Seminole held that where state law, gaming laws, were not criminal in nature, but civil in nature, then they did not apply on Indian reservations. Even though California and Florida both appealed the Barona Ranch and the Seminole rulings, the Supreme Court did not take those cases. That is, until the Cabazon case had the same issues. And this scared the hell out of us, out of me. So I drafted a, what I now call a sellout bill for Mo. It was a very bad bill, but it was an attempt to try to salvage something before the Supreme Court came and took it all away. We were all very surprised when the Supreme Court came down almost a slam dunk for the Indians. We jerked our sell-off bill off the table and we slammed that other bill down and, and uh, eventually that bill became law. That bill became the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. We made some compromises 
and that that was not good for Indians. But the one thing we did do in, in IGRA, as we negotiated it, was where there was a tribal state compact for class three gaming. We'll just shorten it to casino gaming. Where there was a, where the state and the tribe involved had negotiated a compact for class three gaming that was approved by the secretary. Then a federal law on the books for years, I can't remember when it was first adopted in the 30s or 40s, which made it a crime to gamble on, to have gambling machines on Indian reservations, we said that law will be waived. And that's the only, that's the reason there are Indian casinos all over the country is because we provided for the waiver of that law. I, I thought there were going to be casinos, but I didn't think they would be the things they are today.